Okay. Um, welcome to everybody who has come to this meeting. This is a first attempt by Critique Editors to speak to address the issues of uh, the webinar uh, the, of the pandemic. It's uh, live on Facebook for your questions in text. Um, and um, uh, uh, we will start with Hilal Tiktin. Hilal, your uh, audio is now muted. I'm unmuting you. So can you unmute yourself as well? And then start. I don't need long introduction. Uh, 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 am I muted? No, you're okay now. You're okay now. Okay, let me show. Yes, the subject is uh, the uh, <clears throat> the present reign of uh, COVID nineteen. What what I want to do is to interrelate it with its setting <clears throat> within the transitional period from capitalism to socialism. That it is part of this hundred year period from where capitalism was overthrown in the USSR, in sorry, in Russia, forming the USSR and changing the opportunities for the world. The way we see it as socialists is that socialism isn't just a, uh, a desire or a possibility. It is a real movement of humanity from a society which is unequal and exploitative to a society which will be a collective collectivity where people are genuinely equal in opportunity in action in position etc and <clears throat> the world is changing towards it whether we overthrow the forms of exploitation or not it is moving in its different forms but they are <clears throat> within the context either of capitalism or the transition period um, deformed that's the background to the way I think we see it, or I see it, <clears throat> see the world developing. And what has happened <clears throat> is we have a complex transition period through which we are living. So to understand what is a total disaster and a period which will be one which is disastrous for the next two years and possibly longer given the cost that uh, we will have to undergo or the world will have to undergo. <clears throat> we have to regard it as a period within this transition period and therefore formed by it as well. So what I want to do is to interrelate the two. <clears throat> the fact is that the uh, emergence of the coronavirus came in a period of overall downturn. So it came about in a period where we, the world had not recovered from the downturn from 2007 and 8. Consequently, the rates of growth were relatively low in the developed world and, the, in, and going up and down in the underdeveloped world. The last few years in the third world, the rates have been very low or negative. Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> the rate of growth has been ne uh, negative in, uh, or, or very low in the third world. And we can expect, just uh, as an immediate uh, aside on this, we can expect, and we are, all, are expect that the third world the number of people who will be affected will, will be colossal. It will be a tragedy which humanity will remember for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Well, the situation was and is unstable, not just now, but in the period leading up to what, we, what has come about. The, uh, the actual virus appeared, in, of course, in, uh, in China. Uh, Trump has attempted to attack the Chinese for it, 
which is completely re ridiculous. But what is true is that the, uh, the star and the state was itself uh, uh, somewhat um, behind in recognizing what had taken place and try to avoid um, action until fairly late on. It's not uh, absolutely too late as it were in the sense that uh, they, they began to act and that had a, a, an immediate effect. But nonetheless, one cannot blame the Chinese as a whole as Trump has done. That is ridiculous. One has to blame Trump instead if, if he wants to talk in that way. It is, of course, a Stalinist state, which means that it is uh, bureaucratic in its actions and penal to people who don't follow orders. However, by controlling uh, movement, uh, by forcing people not to in interact, they were able to slow down the progress of the virus. What has become very clear is that that same kind of action obviously will not follow in the rest of the world. The rest of the world is not ruled in the same way. Um, on the other hand, on the other extreme, where we've had the examples of uh, uh, Britain and the United States, where they didn't act in time. And it's uh, interesting to note that the, um, uh, the polity have not uh, actually attacked governments for this in any great sense, but it's clear that the government has not acted. It's also clear that under private enterprise, it's not able to act in a way in which could it could act, that's to say, if we had a, a collectivity or a socialist uh, society, we would be acting collectively, democratically and collectively in order to contain it. Instead of which it, it's been done in a ham-fisted way, and it's not at all clear where we are going and almost certainly it will last a lot longer as a result. It's not stable, it's not stable as it stands. And it's clear that it will involve real hunger in large parts of the world. That say more hunger than exists today, those people will not be able to work. They will not be able, if they are agriculturists and they're working in farms, they're not be able to actually dig the, the ground when they're ill or when they're, uh, uh, children or, or greater family are, are, are there. So we are talking about a major tragedy, not just in the awful rise in number of deaths, but large numbers of people starving in other in parts of the world. The problem behind, which is part of this, is that it's being dealt with through anarchy rather than anything else, rather than planning. It's very interesting that the, the, um, the head of the EU um, scientific uh, body, which was involved with this, resigned, as we know, in the last few days. And he resigned, he resigned precisely because he said they were not permitting a planned dealing with the whole thing. <clears throat> there ought to have been a subsidy for this, a separate institution, that it ought to have been collectively done, not just, uh, as it were, within the EU, but between all the nations, like the United States, uh, uh, Canada, in addition to the EU, Britain, pooling their resources to, to develop the uh, necessary vaccine and any other medicines as fast as possible. As far as I can see, there are a very large number of medicines we are which are being proposed. There's a tremendous amount of research. It ought to be pooled, and there ought to be a, a body or a series of bodies which are interrelated, related, and working on this. That isn't the case. <clears throat> what we have is anarchy, effectively, in actually dealing with it. It's anarchy in terms of science in dealing with it, and it's anarchy also in, in terms of the direct dealing with the situation, seeing to that as few people as possible actually get the uh, disease. 
uh, uh, <clears throat> it's clear that Britain and America were late as compared with the EU. There was no need for that what, what, whatsoever, but the government in this case, as they regard themselves as being in the uh, conservative uh, side of politics, believe that they ought not to order people to act, that private enterprise will do whatever it will do. Well, neither of these things came off. They were, uh, they have been in Britain forced to lock down. The United States, as I can see, is simply a mess. Obviously, the number of people who will die will be a multiple of the number of people who could die, who had to die. So the whole way it's been dealt with is the kind of way you would expect in a situation which, as it were, is in transition. It's uh, a capitalism which already is changing and is not socialist. Consequently, it doesn't really know where it's going, putting it in a, in a more general um, sense. The contradictions within the system have become contradictions of the contradictions. <clears throat> Many people have <coughs> take the view that one cannot understand modern society at all, but that isn't true. One can, but it's, it's a complex entity today, more complex than it had been or would have to be if it, if it had been a socialist society. We are paying the penalty, one of the penalties, of society being delayed in its forward movement and towards where it, <coughs> it could rule itself, where it could ensure that the whole population received everything that was required for all. <coughs> <It's, coughs> in fact, on the one hand, governments have provided more in subsidies than in the past to companies and to the workforce. On the other hand, let's say the, the developed countries, on the other hand, incomes, even the best cases are substantially reduced. And some groups of people, like those in zero, zero hours contracts, or working for themselves, may not get anything. On the one hand, the capitalist form remains. But on the other, the government is subsidizing both companies and workers. They are seeing to it that they do not end up with a massive inflation. The nature of the inflation is an issue. It had been expected after 2008, but it didn't happen. Of course, it's perfectly possible for the government to subsidize on a large scale. It's perfectly possible for a developed country to do it, because it's got the resources and it has the skills of the workforce to do it. In third world countries, they don't. The result, or one could imagine, one will imagine, one does imagine, is, is going to be horrendous. And the fault lies with the fact that there is total anarchy in on the world scene. Had there been some kind of uh, international institutions which could actually act and fund and draw what, what could be drawn in terms of labor or money, it might might have been different, but this does seem to the way it was going. Um, how much longer do I have? Um, you have seven more minutes. All right, well, okay. in, the, in, the, in the last um, seven minutes then, I, I'd like to interrelate this then with the reality before and what will be afterwards effectively. Uh, the fact is that the world did not recover in the period after 2008. In a certain sense, therefore, uh, a plunge of this kind is really part of uh, an increasing downturn. Uh, the idea that it has done so is just uh, nonsense. Uh, interestingly, um, in 2012, it was pointed out in relation to the EU and the Financial Times that if they didn't agree to the elementary form of uh, a banking union, which they fact that Germany would be subsidizing the rest of the EU, 
they would continue to be in crisis. Now that's only one part of the world, but it's a very important part of the world. But the interesting th point is that the necessary progress towards a certain unity and common uh, action simply could not occur. It's absurd if you actually think of it, that's why I've taken this example, that Germany, the richest country, wasn't prepared in its own long-term interest to subsidize other parts of the EU, but they weren't. In this uh, crisis, one may expect something similar, which is what I've been through. There's a, a, a fight between those who are prepared to subsidize and those who are, uh, who are not. At the same time, <clears throat> if we look at the world as a whole, what has been happening in this last 40 years has been a shift away to, from a, a social democratic compromise which had been reached which had been reached after the war towards an, an attempt to return to a uh, an outdated form of uh, capitalism that's to say <clears throat> by privatizing what they could privatize and, and go for a, a large range of incomes for a small number of very, very rich people who play a crucial role in the e e economy. And in this downturn, that has been maintained under the uh, slogan of austerity. Austerity has failed. It's clearly failed. They know that it's failed and they have to make a turn. The turn that has been made in America and in Britain is in, uh, as one in, in which effectively they talk about ending austerity without genuinely ending austerity. It's not an accident they, that they have been subsidizing up to a point the uh, isolation of uh, people. Something I, it's not clear that Theresa May will, would, would actually have done. Standing from the far right, they are, they are prepared to do that as concession to maintain private enterprise effectively. It clearly isn't going to work. One of the aspects which the Financial Times has drawn out in one of its articles is that all the arguments for private enterprise, the independence of private enterprise put forward by people like Ayn, Ayn, Rand, Ayn Rand are now contradicted by the government's acting in order to preserve the population. So it's a, a situation which is both calling in question the whole nature of capitalism and a, a situation in which the uh, uh, movement of the system itself is demanding change, demanding that uh, capitalism, the capitalist form, the form of private enterprise be superseded. At the same time, of course, present governments like that in Britain and America are the exact reverse. So one has both a fight to survive the virus and a fight to ensure that society will be able to take much stronger measures in future when such a virus uh, comes about. And perhaps this period may give the opportunity for moving forward. Thank you. Okay, um, Mick, it's you, 15 minutes. I'm gonna unmute you. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right, hi everybody. Well, the number of deaths in Britain now has risen today to 8,000. And about 20, 25% of those are in London. It's the same pattern you find in New York or in other major cities um, across the world. Altogether, there's been 100,000 deaths since the pandemic began three, four weeks ago, however long ago you want to date it from. And we've seen uh, the worst recession since 2008, and it's probably going to get deeper than 2008. This is clearly the most serious pandemic since the great influenza 
pandemic of 1918-1920, which gives you some idea of the seriousness of this. Uh, it's also by far and away the most uh, problematic from the point of view of the, of the world economy. And in a way, the system is caught between a rock and a very hard place. The rock is basically that the measures now being taken to slow down, and only to slow down the pandemic, are basically undermining the world economy, quite simply. And that's the worry from the point of view of the corporations, the point of view of workers as well, are losing their jobs and their millions. And there's clearly no, no, even the richest countries in the world, like the United States and, and Great Britain and others, are simply not able to, to cope with that. On the other hand, if you begin the process of decompression, i.e. Uh, go back to where we were a, a month or six, the, then the numbers of people in the world will, will die in, in even greater numbers. So to say we're between a rock and a hard place is really a cliche. It's a fundamental contradiction because if they continue with the measures which have been undertaken in order to slow down the pandemic, then the world economy goes into a very, very deep recession from which it's going to be quite difficult to recover. And the consequences of that are going to be huge. On the other hand, if they go back to work or at least try, try to go back to normal or some kind of normality, then the chances of this pandemic continuing uh, on and on and on. So you can, see, you can clearly see where, where we are. There's no easy way out of this. On the geopolitical side, on the geopolitical side is what I look at quite a lot, very briefly. It's pretty obvious. A lot of people are talking today as to whether or not China itself has come out of this in a much stronger position. And, and clearly there is some kind of recovery, insofar as we can believe any of the statistics coming out of China, which frankly I, I very much do not believe. But nonetheless, it seems to me that if there is a test of the system, then this is the most extraordinary test of the system more generally right across the world. And each of the systems has failed. Um, China failed. Now, where, where, where this originated, we can talk about for a long time. Nonetheless, we know that the, the immediate catalyst for this was what was going on in central China, Wuhan, which then spread out. And whatever, whatever China may be doing now, it's sending lots of medical supplies to Europe. It's just sent a lot of medical supplies, by the way, to Serbia. It sends uh, medical supplies also, I think, to Italy and to Greece. It, it is a major uh, uh, manufacturer of many of the goods we, we need, actually, in the pandemic. Nonetheless, the system failed abysmally. And then failed in large part, as Hillel, I think, has hinted at, because of the Stalinist character of the system, quite simply. Uh, the information was not given, they denied things, they held on. Uh, I, I said to Hillel, it, it struck me like Stalin's failure uh, to, to listen to the intelligence in the spring of 1941 before Germany invaded. And, uh, and, and you suppressed all the information, you, 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 you just would not, were not prepared to believe. I think it's, 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 that, it's that kind of catastrophic nature of the failure of China, really, whatever they're doing now and however able they've been, and it seems they've been partially able to, to, to get back to some kind of normality. Nonetheless, I still think we've got to be clear about you know, China's role in laws. We don't blame China, but we've got to kind of keep a focus on the consequences of, of what's actually happened in China and the consequences for the rest of the world. And there's actually no doubt either, and we've had people doing work on this, the impact on the Chinese economy has been huge. Whatever partial recovery there's going to be, and we don't know how much that's going to be, the impact on the Chinese economy is simply going to be huge, already is. They've lost 20% of GDP over the last three, first three months of this year. And if China is still, therefore, not moving forward, then the rest of the world economy doesn't move forward either. So, but not only has China failed, uh, the European Union has failed. Uh, the, as, for those in America, I know you're, you're more likely to be focusing on Trump and, and what Trump has been or not doing. Uh, but nonetheless, in the EU, the, the, the reality is quite clear. Uh, as, as an organization, as a collectivity, it has failed. Um, and it has failed to come up with the goods. It has failed to come up with a collective response. Uh, and I think, as Angela Merkel put it the other day, you know, this is the greatest existential crisis actually threatening the whole structures of the European Union. And thirdly, most obviously, the United States has failed. Um, now, whether it made any difference, whether or not uh, somebody else would have been in office other than Trump, I, I, I seriously doubt it, because I think many of the failures in the American system have to do with inequalities, 
have to do with the nature of the health system and many other things as well. So I think we can end on there's not blaming one, one side or another, one country or another. Whether we say that some countries did better than other countries, that strikes me as a kind of wrong way to approach the problem. It is to say that each of the different countries, the most important countries and systems in the world, basically failed. And, and I think this is a failure of the total system. Um, the crisis itself, in turn, very briefly, has been made worse, it seems to me, by three factors. Um, paradoxically, it, it's been made worse by China's integration into the world economy, because that, that have clearly has spread <laughs> the virus. Um, uh, but also, it's been made worse, secondly, uh, by, by, by what Hillel referred to as the kind of increasingly uh, disintegrative anarchic policies which are now being pursued. So you, you both have the disadvantages of one of China being integrated into the world economy, thus spreading the problems right around the world. And then it, then it, self, it takes on its own, gener it then becomes self-generating in each of the countries we see in Italy and elsewhere. So it's not entirely a Chinese question, but China's role in this is, is really quite central, at least in initiating this. If, if not being the fundamental ongoing cause of it. Uh, America's uh, role in all this, it seems to me, is crucial. Uh, it's not just what Trump has not done at home. It's, it's been Trump's policies over the last three to four years globally, which have clearly made any form of cooperation very, very difficult indeed, if not impossible. The only way out of this would have been some form of collective reaction to, to the crisis. And, and some have made the, the parallel, and it's not an unreasonable one to make, but after the 2008 financial crisis, there was at least a collective response uh, of some degree. Um, and there's been none so far. And that tells us how far, how far we've traveled or how far we've gone backwards since the crisis of 2008. The third thing, which is clear, is going to make this crisis profound, long lasting, and tragic in, in, in the sense that the word tragedy really doesn't do justice to the word, to what's going to happen. It's simply the crisis of inequality, it's the crisis of poverty, it's the crisis of failures of states around the world and systems around the world provide the basic needs for most of their peoples. I think in the end, Germany will get over this, Italy might get over this, Britain will get over it. You know, the advanced economies may get over it, but even there, the inequalities and the un unequal distribution of the pain of all this is huge. You can see this for African Americans in Chicago, you can see this in New York, you can see the same in my own constituency here in London, where it's clearly affecting much worse uh, uh, bl black British uh, citizens, uh, black Caribbean citizens, uh, citizens who have to go out to work. You know, they can't use, they don't have credit. <laughs> They have to go out to work. They live in more crowded conditions. Um, they simply can't, you know, use all the advantages of working from home. That doesn't, it doesn't mean for them. So and, and the inequalities which have had such an impact both here in Britain and I'm certain too in the United States, they're going to be even exacerbated to an nth degree by what we're going to see unfolding in, in, in some of the poorer parts of the world. You know, the global south. I mean, we just have only begun to see the tip of the iceberg here. What is going to happen in India? You know, what is going to happen in Sub-Saharan Africa, South America? What's going to happen? What is already happening in many parts of the Middle East? What's going to happen to, to the millions of refugees in camps where there's absolutely no, there, there are, there's hardly any infrastructure to deal with this in very large parts of the world today. In the end, America will build some infrastructure. Britain is building some infrastructure. Thousands will die. But the real impact of that is again going to be on the poor, the destitute and the oppressed. Uh, of, of the world. And two other final points just to make, um, and Hillel hinted at it, I'd make the point maybe even stronger. You know, it's, this is clearly also a failure of, of, of liberal economics. And one of the great paradoxes and, and one of the great outcomes of all this, of course, the only way, the only way countries like uh, Britain or America or anybody else is going to manage this crisis is simply by having a much stronger state. The state will simply have to play a bigger and bigger role into this. Somebody, somebody said the other day that we've got the most right-wing economic government in Britain we've had since Margaret Thatcher, and that's saying quite a lot. Nonetheless, we've got a government now which has had to implement all sorts of policies 
which add up to what somebody called a kind of form of state socialism. And it's not really that, but the pressure of the crisis, if the system is to survive, and if people aren't going to die in even greater numbers, then the state is going to have to play an increasingly big role in, in the management of this. The only problem is that in many parts of the world, this being my last point, many parts of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, in other parts of the world, the state is simply not there. The state is simply not there to fulfill the functions of what we would say is, is the purpose of a state in a, in a, in a modern, modern economy as in the West. So we continue, therefore, in what is clearly, by, by any stretch of the imagination, the biggest crisis since the end of the Second World War. Um, we don't know where it's going to end. I don't think governments really have a clue themselves as to where they think it's going to end. Uh, one of the most appalling aspects of all this, of course, I have to say straight away, is the kind of return of a kind of eugenicist language, too, that we're hearing. And I have heard from, from a, a number of so-called, so you know, so-called liberal, so not liberal conservative people, kind of talking, well, you know, if the old die, well, then they've had, they've had their whack. <laughs> uh, you know, so <laughs> there, there is a kind of um, way in which much of this is... Um, emphasizing that the, 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 in, in some sense that many, many people of a certain age, you know, are dispensable. And if that's going to be the way forward, then, then that, again, is extraordinarily worrying to see a kind of return of what I call a, a kind of low-level but nonetheless highly unple unpleasant eugenicist, uh, ageist uh, uh, rhetoric um, over the last. So there are no, there's not a good story to tell at the moment, I'm afraid. Thanks very much, Mick. Um, Bob, am I going to have you now? Is that a good time? Well, I was wondering if I could come in for two minutes first. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, I just wanted to do a quick, a quick temperature check. Really, um, you know, first, great to see all of you there surviving. We've been in lockdown for three weeks here in California, and I think just, you know, that this is sort of a testament to the kind of anarchic and chaotic state of the United States that at least in California, there's a Democratic governor that took some precautions. And so perhaps it won't be as bad here as it is in New York, but we have no way of knowing yet. I just wanted to say two or three things. One is that one aspect that we're seeing right now here in the United States is that hunger has exploded and that the food banks that exist have miles and miles of cars lined up to get to them with not enough food. And this is not you know, provisions from the state, this is charity. And yeah. that's what we're left in the United States. The state has failed. And not only that, is that the head of the state, Trump, is uh, misinforming, disinforming, and showing incredible cruelty. And that's really a way of sort of characterizing the nature of the United States right now ignorant and cruel. And the other part of it that I just wanted to say very quickly is that we now officially have over 10 million people signed up for unemployment, which means that unofficially it's more than double that. So tens of millions of people have lost their job because Congress is weak and, um, and the Democrats are horrendous. And so they would not even propose the kind of income support in the way that Europe has done to, you know, to keep payrolls going and subsidize them. And so instead, even my daughter, everybody's been laid off. And whether or not any of those jobs will come back or how many of them will come back is anybody's guess. But the other cruel part of the United States, as you probably well know, is that when you lose your job, if you had health, health con coverage at your job, you've now lost it. And so we're going into this pandemic with tens of millions of people uninsured. Mm -hmm. And even the EMTs, the emergency medical technicians who drive people from their homes to, in ambulance to the hospital have never had coverage as part of their jobs. They're a low paid workforce. And so what I'm sort of just kind of agreeing with Mick and Hillel is that we're now going to see a depression, the magnitude of which or we're already in it, we've never seen. And probably even worse than the 30s, it's hard to even say. But I just, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of leave that there and just say one last thing about um, where Mick left off, which was this, uh, you know, that right now we need some form of statist response. And I just spoke to uh, James Galbraith the other day, who's written a great article just on this. And it's, you know, what we've seen is the spectacular incapability of capitalism to deal with a crisis like this. 
And I think that that would be a good way to introduce Bob because I know that right now, Bernie Sh Sanders, which represented the only sort of political hope for any kind of rational left social democratic solution is now out of the race. We have, you know, we have pent up demand and a very large left wing sentiment in the United States now with zero representation in the political class. I shouldn't say zero, but in, in this terms of this race. So, you know, hope is, is little, I can't wait to hear from Raquel to talk about perhaps how it goes in Portugal. But I think we're left with, you know, pining for some sort of status response where the state will actually take over, you know, the functions of a capitalism that is completely incapable of doing anything. With that, I'm going to yield to Bob. Thanks very much, Susie. That's a good introduction. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Liz, can I see the comment? Uh, yeah, yeah, here. Have a, no, no, no. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll time you. 1035. Okay, go. 1035. Just start. Please, marking time. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do is um, lay out very quickly the uh, framework I'm working from and um, uh, see uh, how far I can get in moving from that framework to the, to, to, to the uh, uh, crisis today. Uh, in a sense, the, the, the um, crisis today uh, exemplifies in a, in a very direct way uh, this framework, I think, and people will see in a minute uh, why. So the framework I'm trying to, um, the framework I'm trying to uh, uh, move from has essentially uh, two aspects. Uh, one aspect uh, would be uh, uh, about the, this uh, whole epoch that we've been living in, certainly from the uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s. I know that's short terms in, in terms of the ticketed view, but um, it, it, it's a long term in many others. So I'd say on the one hand, you have decline. Uh, centrally, you have decline. And then from around uh, uh, 1980, you have a restructuring of the core of the economy uh, to uh, effectively uh, predation. So it's a combination of predation and decline. And uh, that's the framework I want to just lay out very uh, quickly. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, first on the uh, economic evolution, uh, what I want to would say is that from the whole of the uh, post-war period, it's characterized by a fundamentally uh, and driven fundamentally by a process in which um, uh, you get uh, uh, driven by a process of one after another. Uh, uh, Dynam dy dynamic export-led manufacturing powers. So, what essentially happens, uh, starting even in you know in the boom, uh, it has the same character. You uh, have the uh, entry uh, of uh, layer developers that have uh, are able to uh, match the technology of the earlier development developers and have lower costs, so they're able to enter into, into the world market, take part of the world market, put downward pressure uh, 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 on the world uh, market, uh, be co combining, uh, that is, uh, the emulated uh, technology and uh, lower costs. So uh, that, uh, I would argue, uh, from the middle 60s to the early 80s, leads to a, a, a process of uh, overcapacity uh, leading to uh, uh, falling up, uh, profitability. So you have, of course, uh, you know, Germany, Japan, uh, then the Knicks, then the East Asian Tigers, and finally the uh, giant, uh, which would be China. So that export-centered uh, development is the dynamism uh, of, of the whole of the whole of the post-war period to today. And it is on the one hand dynamizing, on the other hand, uh, self-undermining cause uh, leading to overcapacity and fo falling profitability. The falling profitability, it, uh, an overcapacity uh, has the result 
of uh, is what is at the core of of the decline because what it means is on the one hand uh, a systematic and continuing and worsening problem of demand uh, demand for uh, investment goods demand for consumer goods demand for um, uh, public uh, state goods and then a that that uh, slowed out in investment from resulting from full in profitability uh, also has a second result, which is a uh, slowdown in, uh, in, 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 pro in labor productivity. So that is, I would say, that is the process that has uh, basically enveloped, in, enveloped the world um, uh, from the, you know, from the 50s uh, to 2010, um, in, including, and I would emphasize this, in, including China, which had a, a lease on life, uh, in part, uh, especially by Amer the American uh, market, American uh, bubble, American deficits, uh, deficit spending, um, uh, American um, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, subsidy of ch uh, Chinese uh, export-driven growth. But when that ends in 2008, uh, the uh, you know the imbrication of the Chinese economy into the world economy shown they had a a, a, a giant Keynesian uh, a stimulus that was supposed to show the difference between China and its uh, its own path, but that completely failed. And from 2012, they've been in the same boat as everyone else. So this uh, the starting point is this uh, this uh, process of uh, worsening uh, overcapacity, flowing profitability. Problem of demand, problem of uh, of, of, uh, of productivity, and that has led to uh, systematically, what decade by decade, business cycle by business cycle, everyone is worse than the one that came before, in terms of every uh, major indicator from GDP to investment productivity and so forth. And uh, for our pr present purposes, most uh, important is that the period. Uh, from 20, the last, uh, 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 fr from the Great Recession, uh, has been by far, far and away uh, uh, the, the worst of all. So in a, in a sense, the Great Recession showed uh, the weakness of the economy, the failure to be, uh, do anything to dynamize the economy since then has, you know, confirmed the process of decline, which by the time of the, uh, of the great uh, crisis that we're into, uh, had been uh, had been developing uh, even you know that is before the uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, hit. So that's the one side of it. The other side of it is uh, predation. Uh, what ha what happened was that uh, as people know, the first re the, there was an attempt to meet the process of disruption and decline. Um, in the late 60s through the early 80s uh, by the standard capitalist means of, on the one hand, austerity, on the other hand, uh, 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 kind of uh, bastard Keynesianism, uh, subsidy, subsidy to demand. But uh, because the problem was not a, a problem of uh, a cyclical problem, it was not a short-term distributional problem, it was a problem of uh, contradictions of a production uh, system wide production these the remedies uh, only uh, worsen things as the uh, stimulus was less uh, powerful I mean had you know ba less bang to the buck for deficit spending uh, 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 the expected problem of demand that came from the imposition of uh, austerity <clears throat> and uh, uh, and then and then runaway inflation. So uh, by uh, 1980, you have a, a, a truly disoriented uh, economic establishment, and this is when you get the big shift. And the big shift uh, has been called, and I think we all uh, uh, know that there's a new period that begins, begins about 1980, and people call it neoliberalism. The problem is that neoliberalism is only a uh, is a uh, misleading because really only partial account of what is, you know is happening. On the one hand, it's true there is a uh, 
you know, a fundamental essential uh, decision, and I think, in, in the leading elements of the of capital and uh, and the state, uh, they're they're go not going to intervene. They're going to let, so to speak, the uh, uh, market work, and that's going to lead to a um, a uh, a reconfiguration of where uh, production is located, and, and it, it's under that uh, you know neoliberal. Uh, free market rubric that we get the shift of so much of the world uh, industrial labor force out of the out of the West in, 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 into East Asia. So that uh, there is some uh, uh, liberalism to neoliberalism, but what's been neglected in the understanding of neoliberalism to me is, and, and probably the most important thing, because it's about um, it's, a, it's about the most the, the central issue uh, really is the reproduction of uh, leading elements of the uh, ruling class, if you will, of the uh, the elite, uh, lead, leading elements of the, leading elements of the ruling class. On the one hand, uh, uh, um, top managers, especially top managers in finance, and the rich, which is, is a, gives you an idea that this uh, definition of the new uh, ruler, so to speak, is a, a kind of a, 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 eclectic mixed up one. So it's on the one hand them and the other hand uh, uh, politicians, top politicians. So alliance of those that, you know, that uh, top politicians provide for the, um, uh, the economic managers, uh, privileged uh, uh, access uh, uh, to all the various and sundry aspects of the economy. And it's that political privilege that is at the key to the um, incomes of uh, uh, at the top. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, the the economic uh, leaders, so to speak, uh, support the uh, uh, political leaders, uh, the, the finance their parties, and allow them to live like uh, uh, live like kings themselves. So you, you have that uh, that alliance that is running the show, and it's all about developing political. Uh, uh, essentially, political forms to uh, uh, take by uh, by uh, uh, political means. Uh, I'm sorry to distribute upward by uh, political means, not just income, uh, but wealth, and that and that is what the uh, story of this uh, epoch is. Well, on the one hand, uh, the liberalism that allows for continuing decline through overcapacity and world restructuring of manufacturing or world relocation of manufacturing. And uh, on the uh, other hand, uh, this imposition of a new uh, forms of predation, these new forms of what the, what this, the, this uh, imposition of new forms of predation is about is turning essentially the whole institutional framework of capitalism, the core of it, which was about nurturing capital accumulation, uh, supporting um, uh, essentially profit making to allow for investment, to allow for expansion. Um, <clears throat> that is a thing of the past. And what uh, the same, uh, what you have is a reconfiguration uh, and addition of institutions to allow instead of uh, uh, growing pie, uh, allowing the pie to stagnate. And it's all about uh, ripping uh, 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 rip off. Now, just really quick, the, I think people can um, see the results of this. The results of this are staggeringly are staggering because what, what, what we had, uh, and I think this is the you know the greatness of the Piketty says uh, team. I think the theory is relatively uh, unimportant, but I think the empirical results are extraordinary because what what they show is an amazing redistribution of income for the last, for 1980 to now we're in a huge part or most of what uh, the, the, the um, income coming out of this uh, very slow growing pie is going to as, as the famous uh, 1% from 1945 to 1980. Actually, that 1% and 5% and 10% did not do particularly well. They had a flat they're, they're part of the world of the income of income uh, did not grow 
And it, that was uh, part of what, um, you know, helped distribution during that period. But suddenly, discontinuously, because politically, you have this change around 1980 and where you had a uh, stable uh, distribution of income suddenly is a, a huge upward uh, 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 push uh, through um, these politically driven uh, upward uh, redistribution. Now to move from there to the crisis, essentially I think the way to do that in the, in the you know, four or five minutes I have left is to, to, is to just touch on what, uh, to indicate what that uh, trans quali qualitative transformation was about. So uh, in state finance, you, what you have, what you previously had are deficits that are part of the Keynesian uh, demand uh, subsidy. Those uh, same tax cuts in the new epoch are, of course, uh, just ripoffs. See, see, each every every uh, every administration makes tax cuts. Put tax cuts at the center, of course. Trump, um, you know, Trump's uh, tax cut is uh, overwhelming, the most uh, crazed of all, but it is not out of keeping with what had previously happened. Then you have social spending, and you had. The, the social spending developing as one would expect, even in the United States in the post-war period, uh, it's about public goods, uh, reproduction of the labor force, uh, uh, goods that can't easily be directly produced by uh, capital itself, uh, big expansion of this uh, in the US, uh, universities, public education, highways, Medicare, all of that. Uh, so, but that quickly becomes, instead of the basis for uh, developing capitalism, it becomes a place for cuts in order to re uh, redistribute uh, to capital. So you have to get rid of these uh, things and people look at the, this uh, system as, how, as, as Susie said, super cruel since all these cuts are taking place, but they fit with the predatory capitalism in which, cap in which capital accumulation is, is, is pretty much uh, beside the point. Uh, most shocking, of course, uh, uh, shocking only uh, because of what's going on today is sort of the, destru the destruction of the, you know, the, the incredible weakening of the medical system. It's incapacity at this point in, uh, in the West of dealing with uh, the uh, pandemic compare uh, in one after another of these spheres, East Asia, where you have uh, manufacturing capitalism um, weak because the world economy is weak, but is still focused on making that happen. Korea uh, uh, response compared to, to, to the American response. Similarly, if you're talking about infrastructure or, 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 a, or anything else like that. So uh, tax cuts, social spending. Big one, of course, is a big one is finance. I think it's generally, it's, it, it, it's, usually uh, misunderstood because people talk about the rise of finance, but really the, uh, could I have five minutes? Um, yes, go ahead, go on. Um, I just need to finish after five, so yeah, go ahead. Go. Five it's, minutes, five minutes. Yeah, okay, so, um, so uh, just in terms of finance, I mean, in, in a sense, the great period of finance was really the post-war period because you did actually have financial services uh, lending to a dynamic uh, manufacturing capitalism that was in the U.S. Uh, uh, also re, uh, reorienting itself to, uh, to, to Europe. But um, what's gone on since the uh, late 70s and uh, particularly from, from the 80s on is the, the collapse of capital accumulation, is, is, is profound slowdown of capital accumulation means a slowdown in demand for loanable funds and a uh, therefore a, a a slowdown in the growth of financial services, and um, what you have is no longer finance serving capital accumulation. Capital accumulation isn't going very fast. Finance is uh, financial services, therefore, are uh, relatively uh, uh, slow growing. And the kind of the um, basic indicator of the new epoch is falling interest rates and falling interest rates, uh, as we know, falling below zero, a third of the 
up something like 30 percent of all debt today is below, uh, below zero loan and nothing could be more indicative of the uh, the collapse of capital uh, capital accumulation, the period, the epoch of uh, capitalism without capital cu accumulation than that. But that itself has now a whole set of results that those falling in, the falling interest rate. It's the opening. It opens the way for a, you know a reconfiguration, reconfiguring of finance uh, around essentially speculation in. Uh, a financial uh, in financial assets centrally uh, in the stock market uh, low interest rates dry, uh, uh, speculatively low interest rates drives those uh, those um, uh, so, so prices up especially in, in stocks the, the this however is also exacerbated by the fact that it's low interest rates which are the only way that the economy has to drive itself forward. It's a paradox that you have low interest rates because uh, essentially capital accumulation is not taking place. It's obviously that low interest rates are not going to make uh, capital accumulate uh, very fast. But uh, on the other hand, uh, they have no other, they have no other, um, uh, sorry, they have no, no other alternative. And so the Federal Reserve is going to keep interest rates low going to open the way for an unbelievable process of speculation where, um, you know, the, uh, effectively you have multi-trillion dollars gains in, uh, you know, in, in capitalization that go to the, to, to the very rich through their ownership of, the, of these stocks and uh, in a situation where profits are, are, are stagnant. So um, just come to a conclusion, um, the, uh, that those low interest rates have, as people know, also uh, skewed um, uh, corporate, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the operation of the corporations, which are also uh, predat have become predatory on themselves. Very little investment, so, uh, so uh, profits used to buy back stocks, pay dividends, but not just that, the low interest rates are, you know, uh, provoke uh, borrowing in order to, uh, the, on the one hand, uh, keep corporations alive that shouldn't be alive, the, you know, the zombie corporations, also allow, uh, you know, corporations on the, that are on the edge to make very risky loans. So that opens a way for a lot of vulnerability. And then the corporate corporations themselves to engage in this gigantic uh, process of borrowing even the you know sort of uh, healthy ones quote because much better to borrow to pay it, pay dividends pay uh, stock buybacks uh, and uh, not and not uh, worry about tomorrow um, and so by the time uh, of this um, by the time of the 2020 which was incredibly weakened economy um, and a, a deeply vulnerable corporate, uh, you know, set corporations who are deeply in debt, not paying any heed to the idea that this, uh, there's going to be the end of expansion. Uh, even if there hadn't been the coronavirus, that would have happened. Uh, and the, uh, they would have left, been uh, left high and dry as it is. Of course, uh, you have, uh, this is what you, uh, where they are, a, a huge corporate debt crisis going into the Crisis, and then you know what I would say is, here you have the worst cat the worst catastrophe ever, as far as I can tell, without any close comparison in the history of capitalism in terms of, of production and the reproduction of the population. Um, <clears throat> what is going to happen to that? The bail the the uh, the recent um, CARES, perfectly named, ironically named CARES Act. Uh, says everything about it because there's uh, like uh, in the whole history of since 1980, uh, the CARES Act does virtually nothing uh, uh, in any uh, long-term way to solve the problem of production, reproduction of the labor force. But on the other hand, it gives the most insane gift to the, the, the financial and non-financial corporations. $500 billion was the, 
bottom line. But as we know, the Fed has now been given 450 of that 500 billion uh, as a cover for its own lending. It now is able to lend uh, uh, to a fact, leverage that to a factor of 10. So they are now, we now have four to f uh, $5 trillion de facto slush fund, no controls on it. And it, it's as if in the midst of this catastrophe, um, the, all of the, you know, the whole trend of the previous period to ignore the social economy, to ignore the labor force, you know, has come home to roost. But for the top 1% or half of 1%, things are only going to get better if they're able to find another planet uh, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to pros live and prosper on. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Raquel, um, you have... Um some time. I'm trying to get to a discussion, so I'm stopping my own talk because otherwise we won't have enough time. So go ahead, Raquel. Well, first of all, hello to everyone. Uh, to you, I meet you all. <laughs> Soon we will be together again and to the ones that are listening to us uh, at home. So I, I wanted to make some short comments on the workers' uh, reaction to all of this. Uh, what we have seen in my point of view was a very, uh, we, we don't see many reaction of the workers because uh, people are stuck at home. So there is uh, no possibility of reaction. And I think that from this point of view, we don't have nothing similar from the past to look at. We saw huge catastrophic crises, we saw pandemias, but we never saw a uh, kind of a close uh, planet where workers couldn't react collectively. And of course, that internet cannot substitute that reaction. But I think that even though we can see some important uh, things. So for example, uh, in US, uh, in the automobile plant in Michigan, here in Volkswagen, uh, in Spain, uh, workers uh, stopped with strikes the production in order to avoid the contamination of the virus. Uh, we saw uh, um, a protest of the health workers in um, in Toulouse in France, uh, which I think is the uh, it's the country where you can see more uh, uh, more strong opposition of the healthcare workers to the state policies. Macron, of course, came very fast, saying that he will do his best to pay me to pay them more. In Romania, the doctors refused themselves to go and treat if they didn't have protection. Uh, and we saw this, for example, here we had also a strike in call centers against this uh, contamination because of course that in Portugal and in the majority of the countries when they send home people and schools, uh, they didn't close the ma majority of the plants and, and uh, workplaces. Uh, so these people were quite uh, uh, abandoned to their, uh, from the point of view of their health. I think this is something that they have experienced, which uh, have shown how capitalism cannot take care of their lives. And this was very important. I think the center of the reaction, in my opinion, the workers that uh, have uh, more fast developed this conscious were the healthcare workers. We saw the most important Western countries with no masks to protect people that were saving lives. It's not that they didn't have a, a extraordinary complex mechanism or machine. They didn't have masks. Here, 20% or 15% of the, of the healthcare workers are uh, positive to COVID because hospitals became a major center of um, a major center of contamination. Uh, I think this has developed a very fast conscience. Of course, the other way I, I, I was recording David Mandel workers on Soviets in Petrogado when he shows that Soviets didn't develop because they were socialists. As all you know, they were not. Uh, Bolsheviks from the beginning, sorry, my phone is ringing here, I cannot, it's, it's the fixed phone, that's why I cannot uh, switch it off. Uh, so the, 
the Soviets didn't develop because uh, they were socialists. They developed because the state could not provide energy, food, safety against, uh, um, against criminal, uh, normal criminal uh, people, the stealing during the war, etc. So uh, I think uh, this, uh, the, the, this question we should underline is that people realized that uh, the states could not take care of them and in what situation they could not take care of them. This is very interesting. What are the states in the world saying to the people? We had a terrible natural disaster and we couldn't do better. Or what we know from science is that if you have, and some countries could do this, like South Korea and other ones, if you have a, a number of texts, texts a number of masks, and above all, a team of professions. So, uh, for example, in some countries in Asia, they have used uh, a team of five persons to follow each people with COVID. And they managed to avoid the spread without closing schools. So we know and we can show that we have enough science. It's not just about the fact that this virus are uh, terribly spreading because of ecological problems, urban problems, etc., that could all be avoided. Well, we don't know if could all virus be avoided, but we know that we have science to deal with this better. Instead, what they have done was a medieval measure, quarantine. It's what capitalism has to offer in 21st century. You all go home and then you all go be dismissed because you all go home. That's what the state said to the working class around the world. Look, we have nothing to give you except using a medieval measure. This is you go home and become crazy there. Uh, and uh, because you are home, then you are going to be dismissed. This is what states have to say to the working classes around the world at this time. And I think this will develop, in my opinion, uh, the majority of the states, including China, I don't think that we saw, we, we are seeing in China return of the strikes and cont contesting the regime. I don't think that states are going back to normal as usual, and they are extremely afraid of going back to normal because workers now are with no jobs and they saw uh, the collapse of the state in front of them. So, uh, uh, for example, in Portugal, uh, it was done an emergency state, as in a majority of the countries, but in Portugal, with the left bloc voting in favor and the Communist Party in abstention, was voting that during the uh, pandemic, workers cannot strike, cannot resist, and unions cannot participate in labor laws. So they are, of course, trying to do what we know from the Marx studies in the middle of the 19th century, using this as a shock doctrine to impose measures, including measures which the problem is not just Orban in, uh, in, Ang in Hungary. They are going trying to impose measures of exception, saying that we are facing a natural disaster, so workers cannot uh, uh, could not uh, complain. So I think what, and, and of course, I, I do not believe that the Eurozone will survive to this crisis. And I think one of the main uh, tasks intellectuals have nowadays is to show that crisis was there before. My grand-grandmother, she uh, lived in pneumonia that killed 50 million people was a much more aggressive due to health conditions, etc. pandemia. And my grand grandmother, she didn't uh, went bankrupt in 1918. How come the states in 2020 say they are going to become bankrupt? And look, look to how it, this is so ideological. They keep comparing this to the Second World World, which is absolutely ridiculous. In the Second World World, everything was destroyed. There were no homes for people living. There were no hospitals, there were no schools. Everything was absolutely destroyed. Now what we have, we have a huge 
number of uh, uh, richness, uh, but it's, it's concentrated in the banks that, uh, of course, as you have explained before much better than me, we just have an economic crisis because ma the majority of these companies were fake. They, not fake in the sense they, they were producing fake things, but fake in the sense that their economic stability was dependent on permanent bank loans and interest rates. So in my street, I live in a very charming, nice old place uh, near Lisbon. And in my street, we have some uh, small business, like uh, the coffee belongs to the family, the bakery. And all these people went home and say, we can pay to our employees for three months because we have money to do this. How come IKEA, FNAC, Google, or uh, whatever, they send the workers to lay off to be paid by social security and they don't have money to leave three weeks? It's because they didn't, uh, either they, they have put the money in the banks, of course, because they are connected with banks, and they show this. They show that uh, uh, they cannot provide people the, the, the means of living. I believe that now this is something that the intellectuals see very well, but I believe that workers, when they will set free from this uh, quarantine, uh, they will massively react, and especially because in order to get back the money that was put it now in a very Keynesian, again, in the economy, they cannot go to the majority of the workers that are, under, that are with salaries under biological reproduction, which is, in Portugal, more than 30% uh, of the workforce. It doesn't have enough money already to feed themselves properly. They have to have subsidies from the state. So I think they will uh, attack uh, the workers uh, that are uh, the core uh, center of the social peace in Europe. Uh, uh, railway workers, uh, public sector uh, workers, um, uh, dock workers, all the workers that uh, uh, in the last 20, 30 years could manage to have a salary above uh, biological reproduction will be strongly attacked in the next years. And in my opinion, they will be absolutely the center of the resistance because they have a huge power in production, which is something that everybody knows Everybody at this moment knows. Everybody knows that you can have the strongest banks in the world and you don't have masks. But you need dockers, you need railway workers, you need healthcare workers in order to have a mask. So uh, one of our bigger fights in the last decades was to show the centrality of labor. And now it's there to everyone to see. We don't have to show it. It's not abstract anymore. It became something absolutely clear to everyone, so I'm I'm very um, I'm very optimistic concerning this situation because we now have a bigger working class, a more heterogeneous working class concerning qualifications. We have, for example, in Portugal, 86 of the physicians are wage earners. They are not they are not uh, uh, owners of their own business. So I think we have a massive proletarianization of the so-called middle classes, which will be part of this uh, struggle that in the limits will lead uh, to revolutionary situations in very short uh, time, in my opinion. So the role of intellectuals here is, uh, of course, absolutely essential because not some parts of this are new. Some parts of this we have to manage to understand uh, but a huge part of this uh, was already studied by us uh, before. I mean, the only news here is the quarantine with the virus because all of what is happening in front of us, we have been written, we have been reading in the last 20 years, and there's nothing new about the collapsing of this uh, in-depth system and the, system and the decline and the dependency of production chains to the Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think, well, we have to trust in the working classes. There's no other 
way out of this since we as we can look to the governments of the world and see that all of them failed including china for one month they have shut down, they have shut up the mouth of the doctors don't allow them to speak that's what china did we should not make confusion between dictatorship and plan we need a plan economy but a democratic plan economy this is absolutely essential so all the states fail the only thing they have the states in the world at this moment is look to bolsonaro we are very bad but there is a guy who is totally crazy i mean it's the only thing they can use uh if i make a uh, if i'm allowed to make a little joke about this thank you so much thanks Raquel. I'm not going to speak because we are running out of time, but before I start the debate, I want to make a couple of points so that we then go on to uh, uh, discuss these points as well. And it's mainly to do with the third world. Um, and I'm starting with the Middle East. I think the collapse in the price of oil um, has changed the nature of the economies in these countries. Uh, they are mainly consumer societies. The oil is the only production in most of these countries. And then the other countries of the region um, can only uh, survive countries such as uh, uh, Egypt, Jordan, other countries. They can only survive because of the um, oil that is produced by these other countries. Quite a lot of them rely on the travel industry, and that has collapsed. Uh, uh, there is an increase in sectarianism, uh, in that uh, the debate is going on in certain parts of the Arab world that it was Iran's fault for spreading the germ into the Arab countries. Um, Iran's own herd immunity uh, proposals were major failure, and it is true that it was the country with most connection to China and therefore part of the problem. But I think the United States is also trying to use the pandemic to score points against third world countries. So the sanctions against countries that are facing uh, uh, these problems have not been removed. Um, and you can imagine that in a situation where at least tens of thousands are dying in countries such as Iran. Um, the la failure to la uh, re remove sanctions has made the situation far worse. There are those who have argued that um, in a way the United States by upping the war in, the, in Iraq has made an attempt to benefit from Corona. My own worry is beyond that. My own worry is that social distancing is impossible in the third world. The, the population lives very close by. They don't have the facilities or the accommodations that would allow people to move into different areas. Uh, there is also uh, both a distrust of the state, but also the state's inability to impose social distancing. The reason for this is that the states are leaving their dictatorial um, measures to the end. They are waiting for the suppression of the working class. And therefore, because lives are cheap in the third world, basically, they are not attempting to even seriously uh, do lockdowns. This is true of most of third world countries. It has happened in India. Uh, it definitely is true of Iran. It definitely is true of Egypt. Places where you do see large communities uh, close to each other. But there is also a distrust of the state. The population in dictatorial regimes does not believe the state when it talks of lockdown. And this failure to accept the, if you like, the uh, health benefits of lockdown creates an added problem. Lastly, I want to address also the issue of immigration. Now, we can see that already people of color, people of Chinese origin, but also of any 
other color in Europe are being targeted as being more likely to be the cause of the spread of the disease. What we knew about Fortress Europe and the, and the European Union, and of course Britain far worse than the European Union's attempt at stopping third world migration, will become an even worse situation because the, the economic collapse of economies in the third world, which is very uh, dramatic and will have consequences worse than Europe, will create mass migration or encourage mass migration, but at the same time, Fortress Europe will try and stop it. I'm leaving the rest because there's a lot of theories about um, these um, Arab countries in particular to later. Uh, I will start uh, the contributions. We have about 40 minutes, so I'm going to try and be strict and ask contributions in response to the debate that has already taken place to as short as possible if you can. Remember that I think this was a relative success. I can see that quite a lot of people have joined in Facebook although we didn't advertise the live session. So we can continue this next week with other contributions. So Hilal, I'm giving the mic back to you, the microphone back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, uh, I think uh, the contributions were, were very good. <clears throat> Uh, I'll just um, uh, start really with um, referring to Bob's uh, overall economic description from 1950 to present day. Um, basically, I agree with it, but he hasn't provided a dynamic in it. Well, he, he's, he's provided something of a dynamic, but the, the overall dynamic is a non-dynamic. I'm surprised he didn't raise it. The, he does mention it does mention the fact that, uh, in fact, um, the, the uh, um, uh, rise in productivity is very, very low. And in fact, it's not just uh, a, an abstract point because investment itself is very limited. And um, what has gone with that is this uh, enorm enormous level of savings which is not invested in fact, or if it's invested, it's, it's um, put into particular um, forms which limit where it's actually going and or may not go anywhere, where you have interest rates, uh, 0.1%, but uh, one or 2%, it, it's, it's so low that there's not much point in it in the first place. Um, $37 trillion is held in one bank, the Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, and it's held um, under the uh, signature of the people putting the money there. What that means is that the bank can't simply use it without permission. So uh, it, it's really largely um, limited in what it's actually doing. So you have this huge level of savings. Now, that's been true from, uh, for some time, and certainly from uh, 2007 onwards. Together with that, you've got this extraordinary situation of three companies, um, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, virtually controlling the New York Stock Exchange. They, they have 40% of uh, what is invested. Now, <clears throat> and it's the, uh, the more important 40%. So uh, the country then into investment terms is controlled by very few people. Not surprised, it's not surprising therefore, and entirely understandable, I don't know why anybody understood anything else, that the uh, um, uh, Federal Reserve Bank um, turned to uh, Larry Fink, who is the guy running uh, BlackRock. Now, interestingly, the BlackRock's funds are six to seven trillion, but you've got this 37 trillion, which is just resting in the bank of New York Mellon. What you've got effectively stasis for the last uh, 12 years, where the, uh, the United States being the capitalist power of the world, the imperial overlord, in fact, <clears throat> uh, both in investment and in military terms, uh, um, 
being effectively not able to conduct its uh, the the uh, process of capital uh, accumulation. It's extremely limited. That's where it is. Um, it <clears throat> one almost uh, is um, uh, compelled to kind of say, well, if you have that kind of stasis, one would would uh, another form of it not show itself? Uh, that's to say, would you, you not get um, a, a lack of watchfulness, a lack of um, control, which might lead to peculiar things arising, or um, worse things arising, like um, the, uh, pan the pandemic. And that's to say, it uh, goes in parallel with the what amounts to a uh, capitalist system which is in tremendous trouble now that to me reflects simply a decline which has existed for uh, at, uh, according to lenin it would amount to 150 years and uh, i i think marxists ought not to back out and back away from the fact that capitalism is in decline and one should be able to understand a lot of what is occurring to do with its decline, its inability to function the way it did function, and therefore its its uh, necessary its necessary um, slowdown or deviation into peculiar forms. That's it. Thanks very much, um, uh, Mick. Um, do you want to make some comments? Uh, sorry, I need to unmute you. Yeah, you have control. Yeah, have yeah, control. okay, thanks very much. Thanks for the contributions. Uh, broadly speaking, agree uh, with what Hiller and uh, Bob said, and, and Susie and Raquel. Very nice to welcome Raquel as well from Portugal. Uh, not much to add, a couple of things, however, maybe. Uh, the point that Bob made, and in a sense, I made it quicker because I had less time, I suppose, but the question of inequality. I think hits us back again at the very heart of this debate. And the inequality at all sorts of levels, inequality racially uh, within America and across the world, the inequality you talked about, I think, Yasmin, the fundamental inequality would still exist between the North and the South or the third world, as you, you use that term, inequalities uh, within, the, within, the, within the advanced capitalist economies themselves. These are so well documented, it doesn't need to be repeated. Uh, Piketty explained it in enormous detail, even if he didn't have much for theory, Bob, the, the, the message got out there very, very clear, did it not? Uh, and the book sold millions of copies, and I think it's had an enormous impact, at least in the public debate. Uh, but nonetheless, those inequalities uh, still exist in, 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 in huge amounts. I'd also add some other, some other aspects of what's been happening in the labor force too over the last 20, 20 30 years. Firstly, the decline of manufacture in the advanced uh, capitalist economies, including the United States, of course, has led to an increasing uh, decline in, in wages. It's led to increased casualization of what we call the bid economy, the gig economy as it's called, much greater degrees of economic insecurity and much greater degrees of job insecurity. And all these things mean that when people in those positions, and there's millions of them in the United States and in Britain and elsewhere, when those jobs are laid off, uh, and many of them have been, they have nothing to fall back upon. They have absolutely nothing to fall back upon at all. And then of course, they therefore in, the, in this extraordinarily, uh, well, well, again, use the word tragedy, in this tragic situation, they've got to go to work in order to pay their rents or, or, to, or to simply to pay for the food. Food banks, by the way, Susie, are increasing in this country too uh, at an enormous rate. E even in relatively affluent part of London where I live, the number of food banks has escalated by 500%. People who simply have to go to food banks to, to feed themselves. This is Britain, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, the same thing is happening right across. So the impact of this isn't just on, you know, what we broadly generically call a working class is also on those parts of, of, of the labor force which has been decasual has been casualized which actually is in a highly insecure 
position as well. And I, I really want to stress that. Because in the end, the, um, you know, the people who are going to pay the, the real price of this, apart from those on the front line of the National Health Service, keeping the economy still going, our, our, our garbage is still being taken away on a Monday morning. You know, these are the people who, are going to, who really are essential, but nonetheless are, are, are the ones who are, are going to take it much more in, in, in terms of the impact of this. It also does raise some interesting questions, too many to go into here, but one in particular, Will it lead, as maybe we could argue, to what I call increasing xenophobia, which I think is what you hinted at, Yasmin? And it's quite, and clearly there's been aspects of that, there's no doubt. Um, on the other hand, I, I kind of, I don't, I'm not necessarily super optimist or super pessimist. On the other hand, it's been quite clear to the overwhelming majority of people in this country that the National Health Service, our, our, our general services, Transport for London, anything which keeps the system going with people who have no protection whatsoever, even in a health service, they have very little protection. That's why the, rates, the, the death rates in the health service are so, are so high. Nonetheless, uh, I think a lot of people have concluded that in a, in a way that many of those essential low paid workers are really quite crucial to keeping the system going. So it may have some xenophobic consequences, and search for scapegoats. On the other hand, I think this might be having some other consequences as well, long term, which following Raquel may be slightly more optimistic um, rather than pessimistic, I think, at the, at, the same, at the same time. The only other thing, just to come back to what you said, um, you have to mean on a third world term, which is hardly ever used today, of course, but nonetheless, I just don't think we've begun to see what the possible consequences are going to be in, sub, in parts of Africa. Yeah. parts of India. I mean, we, we, and we don't even know. We can only... Absolutely. And if we are worried about the numbers of deaths in the United States or the UK or Germany and across Europe, uh, and indeed in other parts of the world, Japan, nonetheless, I, th I think, you know, this is going to be a tsunami. And the, and the tsunami consequences of this, where there's no health care, there is no infrastructure, there's nothing in many parts of the, of the... And they can't do social distancing, as you so brilliantly point out, Yasmin, the consequences are going to be absolutely devastating, absolutely devastating, catastrophic. And uh, what, the, what the results of that are going to be over the medium and long term, uh, we, can, we can only guess that. But again, thanks for the conversation and the discussion. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, Rick um, uh, Bob and Susie, let me, yeah, I'm just going to, yeah, go. Um. Okay, am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah. You should be. Um, great conversation, and I'm really, really glad to have been a part of it, even in a very minute way. And I just want to echo um, a couple of things. At first, I want to say that, you know, Hillel, this really kind of proves what you've been saying since that article way back in Critique 25 about what a socialist society would look like in that, uh, you know, most of the workers are going to be involved in care. Um, and that this is really the essential front line. And we've seen that. And I think one, one interesting aspect, and Raquel brought this out somewhat, and Mick just now as well, is that we have a new definition of what essential work is. And here it means the delivery workers, Amazon, grocery workers, um, and of course, healthcare workers. Um, education continues at home for most people. You know, that's another part of it. But for the most part, the frontline workers are all very low paid. And in the United States, um, also not as, I think you call it zero hours, that's certainly true for many of them, but you know, without benefits, and we've seen in, in this country, uh, you know, a spectacular collapse of the ability of, of the so-called best you know, medical system in the world to deal with this situation. And it also comes at a time in the United States where we have more homelessness than ever before where you have at least a half a million people who are homeless. Here in Los Angeles, the mayor has commandeered the big fancy hotels and homeless people are being put in the hotels right now. And it's really quite a West End and other hotels. It's quite extraordinary to see. And the medical personnel have been uh, dispatched to these hotels where they're taking their temperature, giving them new clothes, disinfecting everything. 
uh, and you know, my, I think this is where my optimism comes in. And of course I'm hardwired to be optimistic, but what we've seen here in the United States and around the world is a spectacular period of uh, massive revolt. Last year was a year of, of, of uprising almost to parallel 1919, I think, worldwide and in the United States, we've seen a strike wave led by public sector workers, teachers, um, hotel workers, others, all around the, uh, all around, uh, uh, and, and that is continuing. We're seeing a lot of strikes right now. Uh, Amazon, Whole, uh, Whole Foods, uh, grocery workers are all engaging in one-day strikes. Auto workers, as you've mentioned, so this is all. This bodes very, very well. But on the other hand. We have uh, no political representation whatsoever. We certainly do have a left here in the United States, but it's in, it is not organized in any way to be effective. We thought perhaps behind Bernie that there would be some chance of the left at least uh, getting some essential reforms that we all struggle for anyway. Um, that may be foreclosed now, probably will be foreclosed for the present. And again, that takes it back to what each of you have talked about, you know, we need planning, but not dictatorship. Uh, right now, I think most of the world would be very happy with wartime allocation, what they used to call wartime socialism, you know, a form of planning that is, you know, from on high, anything right now to get essential goods to people who are really, really suffering. And as Mick said, and in, in, it's stunning for me, who lived in Britain in the 70s, to just imagine how low it is sunk that britain is is like the united states now that its social safety net isn't just shredded it's just got large holes like here as well and probably everywhere else that we're speaking of um so i mean i i just think that uh, just to leave it you know just on the that i really would love to see some form of discussion but about the present, not about necessarily that we're moving into a period of socialist revolution, but right now, what should we be demanding? You know, what kind of status solutions to deal with this that, you know, might open the way for more combativity and hope and activity? And the final thing, of course, that we're all dealing with, and I'm teaching a class on social justice organizing and teaching another one on inequality and everybody's asking the same question. How do we practice social solidarity and activism in a period when there's social distancing and isolation? It's a challenge. I don't, I'd love to hear other people's ideas and what people are doing. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I'm, uh, I, I think, um, I, I'm, I don't want to, um, I'm not sure I'm properly understanding Hillel, I'll do, I'm doing my best. Uh, I have talked to him a few times, like hundreds <laughs> in the past, so, um, possibly um, we can at least uh, see where we differ. Uh, I think we both, uh, you know, are uh, focused on uh, decline. Uh, I guess what I would say, and I was a bit surprised that Hillel said that I didn't have a an explanation or mechanism for, uh, you know, for decline. And I think um, the, what, what um, the approach I'm trying to present speaks to in your position is to uh, be able to take into account what is a, an apparent um, huge uh, expansion of capitalism that seems to uh, speak against your the idea of decline. Um, you know, since basically since uh, uh, World War One, the uh, the the interwar period, I think the idea of uh, decline, when it was presented uh, and was taken up by some Trotskyists, I'm not saying you uh, yourself, but you know that there was the idea that capitalism could never develop. Uh, you know, uh, the so-called third world. It could never encompass the world. And I think what at least superficially uh, challenges your view is the gigantic growth of, of the world proletariat, the gigantic growth of the productive forces, uh, even though, um, you know, we, we have infinite, um, uh, I, I put it like this, if you compare, uh, you, you compare what the world was like in terms of the labor force to the pre-capital situation, it seems like 
uh, it's very difficult to talk in terms simply uh, of, uh, of decline. You have to somehow uh, take into account the apparent, um, uh, I would say the key thing is expansion of capitalism, the expansion of the proletariat, and a part parcel of that expansion of uh, the productive forces. My view, what I'm trying, what I'm attempting to do in relationship to this is to, uh, is to grant that and, and see that. Uh, and the, my point of view is the kind of expansion of, of global capitalism. Uh, but by making the argument through this idea of one after another entry of ever lower cost uh, um, manufacturing uh, productive powers, it, it uh, pr provides at least, I hope, a way of looking at the uh, sort of outward form of, of expansion, but uh, gives an idea, uh, but allows us to see that that expansion is, uh, so to speak, uh, um, how you say, involutionary. That is, um, it each that that the development of capitalism is at the expense of the already existing uh, capitalism, and it's uh, uh, you know self parasitic, even though expansionary. And so that would be. Um, my attempt to, you know, in the most broadest terms, to, to speak to your notion of decline, it's to say, I think that what it's up to you to do is to, you know, connect the uh, the argument about decline with certain empirical uh, realities that people will, you know, call uh, your your attention to. Okay, so that would be, I guess, the, you know, the the the. The, the broadest way I'd speak to, to what you're saying, and then essentially, you know, the the um, the argument would also be uh, that uh, I would I guess that um, part and parcel of a kind of a, a a Lenin position would be that the the highest stage uh, would be essentially a, a, fin a finance a, a finance capitalism, and I, I think that um, the difficulty with that is that the finance capitalism that emerged in, 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 Lenin, in Lenin's time was actually, and I don't know if he would disagree, I mean, analyzed by someone like Hilferding, is that it was part and parcel of a, of a productive, of, of capitalist production, um, internationally competitive, um, imperialist rivalrous war you know leading to war but um nonetheless uh finance capitalism was tied to uh product a, a, a productive uh version of, of capitalism and i think the difficulty what's what people what what our challenge is today is to understand the development of finance as it actually took place which i don't think can be understood a kind of uh, quote, organically uh, in, in, uh, in, in these terms, because where you do see um, capital, uh, finance developing organically is in the immediately post-war boom in the United States, a gigantic, uh, successful financial sector. And then, of course, in, um, in uh, the most dynamic manufacturing economies, which are also uh, have a uh, or versions of organized capitalism, which can also be understood, again, in terms of the Hilferding-like um, finance capital. But I think the fact of capital of finance that we've seen in our period since 1980 is this gigantic, incredible rise of, of, of finance in a way that has nothing to do with production and is completely parasitic upon production. You know, as I, as I was trying to talk about um, uh, parasitism uh, as the other side of, de of decline. And, but the, I think you can't grasp that except in, in terms of actual political, uh, a kind of political reorganization of the leading elements of, 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 um, of the political and uh, economic elite in order to 
reproduce themselves no longer through capital accumulation, but um, uh, by, by predation. And I think that has no, that doesn't follow sort of in, in any kind of evolutionary way, um, either with the, the production decline that I was talking about, or let alone a, uh, a you know, an expansionary, a progressive idea of capitalism that none of us have. You need to you need to see a political uh, reorganization, and you need to see you know in in terms of what Mick was saying. Just I'll, I'll I'll come to a conclusion here that you know this is on the one side is this rise of the one percent, which I think has to be understood in terms of this political reconstitution of uh, the leading elements of capitalism. And that reconstitution means that they allow continual decline. There's no attack on continual decline. So it all has to be redistributed. So everything is redistributed out of a declining pie, a huge redistribution upward. And what that leaves is the, you know, a gigantic type of inequality that I think is the greatness of Piketty and Sayers because it's not about uh, simply the uh, capital share, wage share. It's looking at the top, at the very top. And you look at the very top, and through political means, they get their ripoff. And what does that mean in the context of a declining pie? Everybody else has ever less. And there's the real heart of the inequality. It's really a very tiny part of the population, and everybody else barely able to survive. And, those, and we know that they can't survive because we, we have followed wage, the wage of uh, weekly wages today are unbelievably, on average, or median, significantly lower than they were in 1975. Absolutely. That means that <laughs> people have to have two, three jobs that, uh, in, in effect, People are on the edge, and 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 the being on the edge was, uh, you know, paralleled uh, uh, essentially uh, by the fact that the the new new labor uh, the additions to the labor force in the West is is ever decreasingly in terms of demand for skill. There's been these studies which show that the demand for skilled labor has collapsed since two, 2000. So. Uh, graduate uh, skilled labor uh, works in um, you know undergraduate jobs. Undergraduate skilled labor works in high school jobs. High school people work in no jobs. And then there's a, so there's this huge uh, you know surplus population. So the vulnerability of the system is ca you know catastrophic. And the the inequality is making for it. And that's the final you know piece of the puzzle is that without capital accumulation the elite um, is all about, uh, you know, taking apart all this, act, uh, you know, all the pieces of the economy that are about the reproduction of the labor force. That's all taken away. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, people are completely vulnerable for the, you know, yeah. for the crisis, which just, this crisis just takes to the nth power what has been going on, you know, since 1980, and especially since the financial crisis of 2007-9. Thanks very much. Uh, Raquel, if you have a few minutes to sum up. I'm aiming to finish in about four, five, four minutes max. So leave me a minute to sum up. <laughs> well, um, I don't uh, have nothing to add. Uh, I think, well, uh, I agree what, uh, uh, what was referred. But ultimately, if I may add uh, one minute, um, um, I think ultimately, of course, this will be a political struggle. So uh, we saw huge changes um, concerning uh, conscience uh, of the, of the um, population of the world about capitalism. But Ultimately, it will depend on the political struggle of the organized sectors. And I think this debate, we have to have it. Uh, it's, it's probably the more difficult debate for us because mm -hmm. all the, the, the revolutionary or 
left organizations with the anti-capitalist view are uh, uh, reduced to small groups all around the world. Let's uh, face it. So this is, uh, of course, a problem. Uh, but um, uh, if then uh, uh, I think if we look to the past, we have to see that uh, probably this was more uh, often that we think of. So if you look to the past, to the number of economic crises and revolutions, usually the working class starts very disorganized uh, and things can change very quickly. Uh, well, we have to, to believe that um, this uh, will be possible. Otherwise, we'll have absolutely a barbaric system. And in my opinion, ultimately, we can go to a huge uh, world war because uh, it, it, these guys that are in front of the government and the states, in the last week, they were stealing uh, ventilators and masks uh, like the pirates in the 18th century. And this was done by France, Germany, US, China. This was not so. This is the, le the, the, the quality of the governments we have now in charge of the world. Uh, when, when the things are um, difficult, they become very soon pirates. So uh, we cannot leave the world in their hands. Thanks very much, Rekha. Um, uh, we are to the end of the meeting. This was our first attempt as critique to produce a live meeting. So uh, I think it was a relative success. Uh, we have quite a lot of people on the Facebook Live page. They haven't asked many questions. So I will look at the text because I couldn't concentrate on it. And I hope we have email communication between ourselves and we can organize another meeting, maybe next week, maybe the week after. But I think we should make full use of this current situation to uh, involve uh, other critique editors, maybe from Africa as well, and um, then make it a proper discussion about some of the arguments that we didn't manage to uh, deal with tonight. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. I'm going to end this. Bye. 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 Keep safe. Keep Bye. safe. Bye, guys. Keep safe. Bye. 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 All of you. Bye. Bye, everybody.